Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series on Hegel's lectures of, on uh, world history, or the philosophy of world history, as it were. My name is Philip, and with me I have the brilliant Dehelius, and we are in the part of the series where we're discussing Hegel's views on ancient China. And what we've been doing, we've been unpacking, you know, his uh, trying to get at the con his conceptions of how he viewed uh, Chinese history and what he found insightful there and how that kind of reflects back on world history as such. What is of particular importance is how the first um, instance of world history is ancient China and uh, it's kind of world history in its immediacy. And what we have for today is we're going to be looking at Hegel's views on uh, the sciences and art and religion in ancient China. So that's right. Up. Yeah, we're going to be looking at the uh, the moments of absolute spirit. Um, and this is a really good section. Hegel, you, th there isn't any mandate of heaven. I'm sure you're very disappointed about that. I'm so disappointed. We're going to have to talk about that later. But okay, we'll, we'll get to it. But maybe it wasn't a thing yet. I don't know. Maybe they didn't know about it. It seems like kind of a big deal to miss. Yeah. It, yeah. No, no, that's, that's the Hegel's big omission there, but we'll fix it. Okay. Okay. So let's Hegel begins with the sciences. So we can also begin with the sciences. Yeah. So I guess the first thing to point out uh, about what Hegel thinks um, about science in ancient China is in the very first sentence, the second sentence of the section, Lack of proper inwardness extends also to the sciences. There is no free liberal science. Indeed. So this so goes it goes in line with the the theme that we are lacking subjectivity in the Chinese state, the ancient Chinese state. Exactly. So just as there is a lack of inwardness in the social political sphere, uh, there is a lack of inwardness in the scientific sphere in the sphere of uh, inquiry into the external world indeed yes um, it'd be interesting to know whether this sort of relationship continues uh does hegel think that it's always the case that a lack of an inwardness in the political sphere leads to a lack of inwardness in scientific or artistic or religious sphere or whether it can be more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now, he's presenting it as if this is a consequence of um, the former. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, it seems like right now we're getting it as one package, right? Yeah. No subjectivity exactly. in one area, no subjectivity in all other areas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, I, and also, and a further continuation of what we saw in the previous discussions about the political situation is this idea that the emperor is held to be the final judge of scientific value. Yeah. So just as the emperor was sort of the the uh, the essence, the, the fundamental focal point of the state and of uh, the behavior of all peoples, uh, so too is the emperor the, the, the arbiter of what is good science, what is bad science, um, of science, he seems to be the the spirit of scientific inquiry. So yeah. again, we have this like to like relationship between the state and something else, science in this case. Yeah. Um. So again, that would be interesting to see whether Hegel thinks political organization reflects itself in spiritual spirit in the Hegelian sense of science, religion, art, spiritual inquiry, or spiritual mm. expression. Yeah. And yeah. uh, one might one might think one instinctively that well this must mean that science is automatically bad because the emperor is, has this much weight on the matter, but we have to remember that the emperor himself was extremely educated, right? Like oh they, like probably the most educated person in the whole nation. Uh, so he'd be pretty pretty well qualified for a lot of the things, right? At least to a to, to a certain extent, maybe not as a expert on some some particular field, but as somebody who can manage and oversee things. Yeah, why not? 
that seems to be the case. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the very least, he has he has the he's in charge of the organization and of sort of what's researched and what's considered good research, what's considered bad research. Um, I mean, to give an example, uh, Hegel talks about how in his last years, I'm not sure which emperor this is, but in his last years, from 1772 on, the previous emperor saw to a new edition of the collected literature consisting of 168,000 volumes. I think Hegel's jealous. <laughs> he tried his best to match yeah. that. <laughs> I think he made it up to like 22 volumes or something, a full <laughs> collection. So we really get the impression that the, the emperor is very much involved and concerned with the presentation of knowledge. And the mm -hmm. accumulation. Yeah. And, yeah. He's part of the part of the uh, that sphere. Right. Unlike you don't know, European kings, you know, at most they were honored, but yeah. they were never regarded as an authority in the science itself. Exactly, yeah. So again, we see this this focalization of this individual yeah. in in ancient China. Uh, not only is the emperor the arbiter of behavior, but also the arbiter of science. Mm. Um and I guess, and, yeah. And and I guess also then that means that, you know, there there must be some freedom in liberal in in the sciences, namely the freedom of the emperor, because as mm -hmm. we've been talking about, he is the one subject in the whole nation. He's the one, or has subjectivity, right, upon which everybody else is rested upon. Right. Yeah. And maybe something of the similar movement uh, is replicated here in the sciences. Maybe. Whereas he does have you know free inquiry he can go into whatever he wants to even though remember i mean you i remember that lovely image you created of the upside down pyramid where the emperor is himself sort of All right. beholden to the mandarins and the people and i wonder whether the, to a certain extent maybe the emperor is also still not free even in science um well as we as we come to learn throughout the, what Hegel says here, a lot of the science seems to be kind of in the service of the administration. Right, yeah. Uh, more as a means to, you know, keep the, keep track of the calendar and spread the, the word of the officials and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I think, yeah, a really interesting, I mean, he, he accuses it of being empirical. Uh, so he says, in the main, the science and culture of ancient China is that of the compiling of information. It is in the main empirical in nature, not theoretical, not a free interest of thought as such. Mm -hmm. Instead, the sciences essentially stand to serve the utility and benefit of the state. As you said, the yeah. state has the science is under its control as means. Ah, oh, so many things to say there. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind when I read that sentence is sort of the introduction to the philosophy of nature where Hegel distinguishes between theoretical approaches to nature and practical approaches to nature. Yeah. And it's the, the practical approach is sort of the most immediate relation to nature that we have. It's we look at nature and we look at it as a means to an end. And we, we try to uh, bring it under our control in a practical sense. Uh, and then for Hegel, the, the next step is the theoretical uh, aspect of nature where you try to theorize about nature and synthesize it under universal laws and uh, I think that sort of in the back of his mind when he's talking about the, Ch the ancient Chinese state not having a theoretical interest in nature or mm -hmm. in the external world uh, and that they have this teleological this means and relationship with nature uh, it's to serve a uh, is, to, is to benefit the state. It's not just for the inquiry as such. Yeah, and the thing about the inquiry as such that Hegel kind of mentions here is that the real interest of science should be in its own internal satisfaction. Mm. He doesn't say, you know, just, you know, getting at the truth, but satisfaction. Mm. What do you think that means? Well, um, he then goes on to say it's inner life in possessing a world of thought. So, so I think that this is, I think it, you know, 
uh, connects up with Hegel's overall philosophy of spirit being the end all of of um, of the system and of of the world, and that what spirit wants the most is to see itself in the world. Mm. Where it can see itself most clearly is in pure thought or a world of thought. Mm -hmm. And then science for its own sake sort of is the path towards that. But it's not really for its own sake. It's for the sake of thought, that thought can think itself there in right. its um, you know, in its categories, I think, or forms or what have you, as those categories and forms. So that's the the internal, the inner aspect of science that is about the development of thought. Yeah. And that thought takes most satisfaction in itself. Yeah. That's kind of like also what uh, how Hegel defines um, desire in uh, the chapter on self self consciousness in phenomenology, where uh, desire is all about making the unity of self consciousness essential. Mm -hmm. Right, so it wants to be with itself as itself, removing all sort of alienation and otherness. Maybe like a bit of the same movement is, is yeah. kind of coming up here, but on a on a scale of thought instead of just consciousness. Right. Yeah, of thought, sort of abstracting from all the practical concerns and just focusing on itself as thought. Yeah. You know, almost almost as you have these uh, physicists nowadays who are like uh, uh, enchanted by the beauty of theories, right? right. Or mathematical aesthetics or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have anything to say, else to say on this section of science? Yeah, are we working on the number one now? Yeah, I think so, okay. yeah. Yeah, um, well, I'm going to say that, you know, I don't think we should be also disparaging of science that is not practical or useful. Mm -hmm. I think we would live in a pretty poor society where science was not useful because, uh, yeah, that would just be... I don't know if if it would be a little bit too um, kind of parasitic, like it would just stop being science and turn into a kind of weird priesthood or cult. <laughs> I think it's definitely the case that we can't abstract the development of science from the development of technologies, which is the application of science uh, to useful activities in life. That's definitely true. I think fundamentally Hegel's concern is just that it's just practical and there's no theoretical aspect to it. Yeah, but I wonder if if we when we're dealing with science and it is practical, it cannot also like it cannot but also be um theoretical to some extent. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to to know more about this, yes. You know, to... if you're if you're going to be building bridges uh yeah, you're like you're, you got if you're going to build like a big complicated bridge then you have to involve science you have to involve theory you have to under involve some sort of idea of gravity and how you know things can be supported and so on kind of yeah i mean romans built bridges how, how much do they understand about that kind of stuff they also built the par was it what's it called the pantheon pantheon that's it yeah that thing with the big dome, right? It's impressive. You know, that is pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive, yeah. There is yeah, science yeah. in that. There's yeah. concepts and understanding of how much you can pile on and how big you can build it. Yeah, there is. There is. It's engineering. Yeah. I guess it, there's I guess there's a difference though between understanding how to do things and synthesizing that 
and synthesis and synthesizing many things under universal laws. Um, you may understand perfectly well how you should go about building a dome like this, but you have no interest in trying to explain that that knowledge um with reference to more generalizable laws about the world maybe mm -hmm. okay so maybe, maybe like you can build the big dome but that doesn't necessarily equate to newton no <laughs> i i mean i think it's, it's something very substantially different going on right when when newton is offering a an, a theoretical explanation for why objects at a distance move in the way that they do, two objects apart move in the way that they do to an engineer understanding how to go about building a dome um right yeah 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 well i think as you said it's the latter is more like the former is more universalizable right right it deals, it deals in higher order yeah like matter uh, yeah. or forms but the practical is obviously essential for the movement into the theoretical i mean that already shows a movement of spirit outside of the identity with nature yeah. and was using nature as a means for itself for its own exactly. expression right yeah so you know thumbs up indeed indeed <laughs> yeah well let's carry on then Okay, so this section two was a very uh, interesting section. Um, and basically, it's Hegel's criticism of the, I think, the expressiveness and maybe the utility of the Chinese language. Yeah. Uh, and I, I imagine the underlying point is the reason why he thinks it matters that it's not as expressive and not as useful um, is probably because he thinks it's, it makes it difficult to do science or do philosophy. Um, yeah, he, he complains about um, this, the signs and I, I don't know what you call, call them, glyphs. Um, uh characters yeah characters as opposed right. yeah because a lot like there's a whole lot of unique characters isn't there? right yes yeah right. so it's almost like every character is its own full sentence or full word right yeah he says so the chinese do not have 26 letters but yeah. instead many thousands of characters the number of them necessary for ordinary purposes is 9,351. Yeah. And in the opinion of some, more than 10,000. Scholars need 80 to 90,000. So, so See, like, that's, as a, you know, that's what the Mandarin had to go through. Yeah. Oh, maybe there's also a sort of a political point here to make that it's such a difficult language for ordinary people to learn that only a certain elite can learn it in its sort of fullness and market and use it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I not so quickly. So the the thing about, that Hegel complains about is, you know, the we have to, you know, there's no stepping stone. You either learn the character, right, or you don't. Whereas in European uh, sort of um, alphabet, Latin, Greek style alphabets, where you have character like letters. That by themselves don't mean anything, usually unless you know it's a. <laughs> usually they don't mean anything. You have to like build them with other things. So we like building Legos, and from Legos we get the words right. Whereas right. the Chinese have finished action figures, right? Get, <laughs> right. Nice. Yeah. Get, you know, uh, uh, Megatron or whatever, right? They just have it like ready done and made. Whereas we have to piece it together. <laughs> yeah. okay. But um, and the other side of that is a meaning, is a concept. Mm -hmm. And 
how many meanings and concepts are there? How many definitions are there? Because that's really what makes something significant. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if at that level, it's pretty much on par when both systems. Yeah. It's just that we get there through different means. Yeah. 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 Uh... So like, you know, for somebody who is, uh, and I think the complexity is just as the same, basically, um, whether it's in Europe and China, because when you read complex stuff in our traditions and languages, it's hella hard, right? Reading Hegel, not easy. <laughs> Reading the science of logic. So um, I don't think this this is, makes a big difference in, in, in the things that matter. Yeah. I think it's a superficial difference. Yeah, again, um, it's one of those weird things that Hegel thinks really matters. He also talks about, he also mentioned this in the Science of Logic in one in one of the introductory sections. And he also talks about how, I mean, un, unsurprisingly, how well suited the German language is to philosophy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, how do you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... I guess theoretically it's interesting. Are all languages equally good at expressing concepts and expressing ways of understanding the world? Is it really just a matter of assigning meaning to a sign? Um, yeah. Why? Why? Like. This, this that question kind of also presumes that a language is what it is forever, but they're not. Languages themselves continuously evolve; they change, right? Right. And they have the capacity to add more meaning to themselves. That's kind of what they keep on doing. But there is a okay, but there is a formal difference, right, between a a a, a, a language like like you said, the language that comes with the action figure ready made. Yeah, and the language that you compose it with lots of um, smaller pieces. Yeah, and you might ask yourself whether that formal difference actually means some uh, leads to a different way of conceptually grasping the world. Um, I don't think it. It. Sh it I don't think it should. I, right. Like I don't think it's an obstacle mm -hmm. inherently, because if you want to get you know, the precise concept from one language to the next and the next language does not have, I don't know, is missing some words, then it'll just pile in other words mm -hmm. to get the adequate meaning, right? right. So yeah. as, I don't know, as an example, I think the Sami have like 26, word, uh, 26 words for snow, right? Because of the, you know, the texture of the snow, the how the weather is with the snow, right? They have all these sensitivity to the snow, right? And yeah. so they made shortcuts. Instead of saying the snow is so-and-so today, they just say a whole different word and boom, they get the concept they need for whatever purpose. But right. that doesn't mean another language cannot just come in and say, well, we have snow, but it, we, we need to capture the sensitivity of snow number 26. And so mm -hmm. we pile in a bunch of other words. Mm -hmm. So we say snow is like so-and-so and so, right? Why, why is this so difficult? But yeah, I yeah. Think, I don't think there, there needs to be anything <laughs> worse than that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's a question of means, right? Changing up the means, not the ends. At least that's that's uh, how it is to my mind. I don't know what you think. I, I honestly don't know. It would be, I think this is, this is, a, this is a question maybe for a, a linguist uh, who, you know, for someone who studies languages and who studies how meanings um, sort of are attached to signs and I don't even know what kind of what I don't even know what, what other question to ask about how this is how this works um, I can I can see that there might be a practical difference right having to say one word instead of 14 in order to get the same definition or concept yes there is a some sort of practical difference there but that's a practical difference, not a philosophical one. So, yeah, we're not interested in. It. Unless, unless practical limitations impede theoretical developments. Yes, of course. 
Well, that then, yeah, that can happen. Um, just that it's interesting because language is the fundamental mode of expressing thoughts, and it seems so. One, you can see why Hegel is talking about it because it's obviously important. It's how yeah. we know how what people think yeah, and yeah. How they think about something. Yeah. So you can see why he he's devoting a paragraph to this. Sure. I mean, so based on that, then you might think, well, the kinds of forms that languages take will, if we look at languages that have different forms, we might think that they express thought differently as well. Um, now, do they actually? Maybe not. But again, this is. I think, yeah, it's very interesting. It would be interesting to know what um, someone more trained in languages thinks about this. Mm. It, it is a whole question. It seems like other disciplines have a... I, I think also maybe it depends on what kind of disciplines we're dealing with. It seems like mathematics is an easier time to be univer universalizable, right? Yeah. And maybe music too, right? Yeah. But where something that is much more sort of literature heavy is much more resistant to being converted to something else. That's true. But I mean, what mathematics and uh, music get in universalizability, they lose in specificity, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they, they are more like um, they deal in a different kind of extra abstraction altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But I, uh, I, 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 you know, this is off the top of my head. This is just mm -hmm. like Philip going, going on the roll. But uh, languages are inherently creative. I think they are poetry at at the root. That mm -hmm. you know, that, I think that's what you know makes a language a real language is that it can has this kind of interpretive fluid quality to it uh, so that when it comes up against you know new concepts new ideas or something it can make use of something it already has and is familiar and shape into some new thing yeah i i think this is a yeah that's definitely inherent quality of any language and Chin chinese is a language like they have that language and so they can do it. I don't think there's a a a, lim a limitation in principle. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we move on? Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna add to that. I I suppose I am against the orth a grain of orthodox philosophers who all bang about you know learning the original languages so everything. <laughs> Plato needs to be read in in ancient Greek and. <laughs> Hegel <and> German. <laughs> yes, I have to say, I don't think I got anything more out of Hegel by reading it in German. I, well, I, 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 the thing with that is that the English scholarship, scholarship of Hegel is so very attuned to the nuances of the German word, like so late we can't shut about shut up about about it, right? Yeah. That. It's there's nothing more to be gained in the nuances when we then step over to German because we've already kind of parsed it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Though sometimes I think during our reading group we found that Miller maybe made a, a small blunder now and again. Yeah, sure. But Very then Di Giovanni also did some critical sure, blunders. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess. Shall we move on then? Yeah, let's go on to the, the third section of science. Oh, here we have him. The lad. <laughs> the lad of all lads. Confusion. Finally, makes a, finally, makes finally a... he comes around. Yeah. And Hegel is not impressed. No, he's not impressed. So first of all, it's interesting. So this whole science thing, I wonder if we're talking about science or we're talking about philosophy or we're talking about science and philosophy. I think it's both. So I yeah. think it's both finite science and then infinite science. Infinite science. Yeah. 
because this language stuff strikes me much more as a concern for Hegel when it comes to doing philosophy. Yeah. But it's the kind of stuff he talks about in the prefaces and introduction to the logic where he talks about language and it's how language is the store of concepts and all that kind of stuff. And 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 Confucius as a scientific man, I would I never thought of Confucius as a scientist. I thought of him more as a philosopher, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a as a thinker. But I guess for Hegel, the the criticism is that he's not a philosopher so much as a moralist. Yeah. Or a moral no. moral educator. A moral educator, yeah. So in his case, we do not find theory that occupies itself in thought as such. His teachings are expressed like the Proverbs of Solomon. So again, very similar to his criticism of science, which uh, doesn't really dwell on the theoretical, doesn't dwell on the inner nature, doesn't sort of satisfy itself in the inner expression of itself, but sort of focuses on the practical side of things. Yes, yeah. moral instruction, right? And so yeah. I think he would more fall into the category of of, of wisdom or being a wise wise man, wise sage, right? Right, yeah. I mean, he compares him to Solon, which is, you know, the lawgiver of Greece, of ancient Greece. Yeah. Um, and there's an interesting parallel with what we discussed earlier with regard to morality and the people and their relationship with the emperor. Um, you know, we spoke about how the emperor is the... the, the the moral compass of the nation. Uh, and it's interesting that Hegel, he, the only the only philosopher that Hegel picks on in ancient China is this moral educator. Well, we will see. He is talking about, uh, what's his name again? Uh, Lao Tzu? Uh, yeah, but that's more in the religion section, isn't it? Oh yes, that's in a religion check. Is it is in more? I, I think so, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I wonder if also you know Hegel's also being guided by the sort of the similarities that he's seeing. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't. Again, I don't know much about Chinese philosophy. So, but I guess the I guess the point is the conceptual point for Hegel is that again we have this activity. Of spirit philosophy in this case where it's sort of it's it's best expression is when it's when it when it's thought thinking itself dealing with itself and here we have thought that is applied to moral matters uh basically applied ethics uh and hegel sees that as a very immediate uh, kind of application of thought yeah, so he um, he complains that for in his case we do not find theory that occupies itself in thought as such. Yeah, um, pretty much. Thing, yeah, so the thing about moral instruction is, or like wisdom, is basically like one-liners or some form of, you know, you have to do so and so, or you should do so and so, and that you should see wisdom in that based on what you've told and just and based on its ex execution. But that doesn't necessarily say anything about why it's good to do, right? Mm -hmm. That may be latent a little bit, but it's still something implicit or latent or something that only comes out once you do it. Uh, but I guess he what Hegel wants to see is a kind of imminent development yeah. and, and demonstration. Yeah, exactly. Which is why he doesn't compare Confucius to Plato and Aristotle or Socrates which exactly go about doing just that, right? Yeah, exactly. Examining yeah. the thing in and for itself, unpacking it imminently. Right, so even Aristotle, like, you know, Mr. Mr. Empirical Observation, he will always, the, the, the ultimate aim of his empirical observations is to unify everything under this higher order of the universe, of structure. Yeah. Um. So I think that's what Hegel is that's what Hegel is uh, sort of pointing out as lacking in ancient Chinese philosophical thought. Um, and I suppose, I, yeah, go yeah. on. No, I was, was going to say again whether it's true or not. I don't know, but I think the point is that Hegel is at least being consistent in the kinds of 
conceptual structures that he's picking out for the yeah. first stage of world yeah. history. Yeah. And uh, to to uh, follow up on that, uh, it does map onto what we've seen him say with regards to the rest of his account of China and that things are primarily in immediacy and in external relations. Because the, uh, if you want to educate somebody in the most external way, well, you just give them basically orders. Right. Right. You don't tell them why they should do it or invite them to contemplate so-and-so. No, you give them instructions, rules, do the rule, <laughs> right? It's yeah, external. That's really, yeah, exactly. So even, even the philosophy uh, is external here. Right. It doesn't invite you to reflect on why this is the right thing. It tells you what is the right thing and you're simply expected to do it. Indeed. Yeah. And then Hegel talks about, he talks a bit about physics. So he, he sort of says, you know, that they knew about magnets and the use of compass needles before Europeans did. Yeah. Again, he's not really impressed with their physics because they didn't really have theories. Yeah. But again, what we said before. Yeah, but they, he also mentions that they didn't know about the thermometer, barometer, pneumatic pump, pendulum clock, yeah. and the lever exactly. uh, until the Europeans came around. Yeah. Which he considers to be actual scientific theories because they are, I presume, because they are based on a theoretical sort of substructure of how things work. Yeah. And then he talks a lot about astronomy, so how they're very good at astronomy and predicting eclipses. Um, but again, he doesn't really consider this to be science per se. Because of the same reasoning, I guess. You know, they're lacking a su systematic substructure to, to ground their their um, activities in i suppose so yeah uh, and then he complains about their mathematics is not up to scratch yeah um however i do think at one point he does uh fall a little bit on his on his foot he says right. their system for counting is not the decimal system like ours, but is binary. They mm -hmm. write all numbers with one and zero, which proves how inferior the Chinese generally are in comparison with other peoples. Mm -hmm. Hang on, mate. You ever heard about computing, about the internet, about <laughs> everything that we, what you and me are using and interfacing through right now? Yeah, and all, all that shit is built in ones and zeros, and it couldn't have been built otherwise. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, Hegel, man, sorry, you. Yeah. That's, that is not at all a sign of inferiority. Yeah. That is a sign of you know great superiority and really great potential, right? I think, they, I think... you know they just didn't invent computing, but computing is rests on this kind of bedrock. Yeah, I think this is an interesting example of how there are many things that Hegel talks about that do not seem to have a solid conceptual footing. And he's just sort of noticing differences. And maybe he's seeing the advantages of a sort of decimal system as opposed to a binary system. And he's saying, well, there are obviously these advantages. And that's why he's then inferring that it's better. But I think there isn't an obvious conceptual reason for why it's an advantage. There's just a momentary practical reason, which will be overtaken in 150 years time by the creation of the internet or computing in general. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That's a really good point. And so that that means that Hegel is really just making a practical point here rather than a theoretical point, which he should be making. Yeah, so indeed. Bad yeah. on him. 
Well, he thinks he's making a theoretical point, but it looks just like a practical point. Yeah, it looks like a practical point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it'd be interesting to know what a mathematician would think about this. And uh, also, you know, we could also bounce back uh, at Hegel in a different way and say, well, all of your science and logic is just being a nothing. <laughs> Which he says himself, you know, there's nothing in heaven and earth that does not have being and nothing. Right. So yeah. it's like those are two kind of pri almost primordial or fund fundamental categories or the purest categories, which mm -hmm. inform all other categories. Yeah, that's true. So there's a little bit of the same with the computing, how ones and zero are kind of like the elementary substructure that everything else is laid on top of. Right, yeah. Can we get to art now? Okay, let's get to art. <laughs> okay, so some of you may have noticed that I have a background that is uh, not my typical background. And this is uh, an example of ancient uh, Chinese painting. It is dated from between the 11th to the 12th century. And it is on a mountain path in spring. So there's a a gentleman contemplating the spring and the mountain path. Very good, very good. There's sort of the other side of it. Yeah. And I thought this, and I think there's like a, there's a peasant in the corner, maybe. Yeah, his servant, something. maybe, his manservant, yeah. Yeah. carrying <laughs> carrying his, his shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, that I, I, th I just thought it'd be very useful to see this because yeah. Hegel cr cr criticizes in Chinese art yeah, and uh, it can be difficult to visualize what exactly it is that Hegel is criticizing. So I thought this would be a very useful accompaniment mm -hmm. to this very brief paragraph on art. All too brief. Yes. So uh, Hegel writes in the field of fine arts, the consequence of all this, what has just followed, is that ideal art cannot flourish among the Chinese. The ideal seeks to be conceived from the inward free spirit, not prosaically, but in such a way that it directly dispenses with something bodily. The Chinese are, to be sure, skilled in the mechanical arts, but they lack the creative power of spirit, the free inwardness. So again, the same kind of criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, lack of subjectivity. Lack of subjectivity, lack of inwardness, lack of freedom a preference for practicality, for corporeality, for the the outside world, like externality maybe is a better mm. word. Yeah. Um, they have brilliant landscape painting, as we can see right here, but they never attain the brilliance that is produced in ours by means of shadow and light. They are very precise in sketching, for instance, the scales of carp. In all these ways, they are extremely precise, but the ideal is alien to them. Yes, Philip. Yeah. So this that was 11th and 12th century? Yeah, right, around there. Yeah, where were, where were the Europeans in 11th and 12th century? They were doing all those uh, med medieval paintings of uh, Jesus on the cross and the Virgin Mary. and uh... They weren't very good now, were they? <laughs> they weren't that good. No. We 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 hadn't at all mastered um, light and shadow then. Yeah, or perspective. Yeah. <laughs> or perspective. yeah you see, you, you you'd see someone sitting, and like their left knee would be way higher than their right knee <laughs> to try and uh, get that. Uh, it looked awful. Um, yeah, and, and it, it was it was very kind of like uh, almost uh, in profile. A lot of the images. Like they were very kind of felt very stiff. They are very stiff. Yeah, I usually yeah. skip those sections in the museum in an art gallery when I go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, it's um, what do we think about that? Because I so all Hegel gives us as a counter example is shadows and light, and I'm just not. I don't know enough about his writings on painting to know what it is that the use of shadow and light is meant to show conceptually. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. That'll I mean, have to be our series on the lectures on the, on fine art and aesthetics. Exactly. Yeah. I think, yeah. 
I mean, it's a very pretty painting. This thing, I think it's very good. Right. Yes. Um, I, at first, I uh, I thought it was, you know, my instinct was at first was Japanese because we always see those similar Japanese paintings, kind of right. in that style, but yeah. a lot more colors and maybe a little bit stylistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this could be regarded as a uh, as a progenitor of those kind of images because the Japanese got a lot of their stuff from the Chinese. Yeah, yeah. Don't say that too loudly. But yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, indeed, yeah. So um, again, one wonders what are Hegel's theoretical reasons for this dismissal. Um, there, there, there's also a nice kind of um, conceptual thing going on with that image. Because there's a lot of uh, drawing and action, like visual action on the left side, mm -hmm. on, on di diagonally left left bottom, whereas on the upper side, you know, it's kind of I don't know if this was meant originally or uh, or if it just faded through naturally, but there is this fade going on. Yeah, on the upper right diagonal half. Yeah, where there's fewer details. There's the bird, you know, s signalizing like freedom, something being up in the air, right? And what bird. is the, up there with the bird? It's text, language, language. And what's the guy looking at? Looking at the text, at the language. He's looking at spirit in its own form, right? He doesn't need any more nature. It all just fades out. He is seeing the text, and that's, you know. So I think this is this is fantastic. Oh, very nice. Yeah, very plausible. That's a lovely interpretation, Philip. I like mm -hmm. it. Oh, and they also have like the branches are kind of nicely bending down again and mm. stepping into the, the ethereal plane of the right. So there is yeah. kind of a connection between the two realms. It's not just him looking over there at something else, but right. also that the natural realm is reaching out towards that. Very nice, yeah. yeah. The peasant, of course, has no chance. But yeah. <laughs> the peasant, of course, he is blocked. He's, you can see that the trees form a sort of like a, a wall. Yeah. The <laughs> peasant is bound in nature. <laughs> He's the bound. peasant is not getting out of nature. Well, that yeah. lesson. <laughs> that's, that's, that's lovely, yeah. So, yeah, again, yeah, you, you, one wonders what Hegel's reasons are. But I think for the purposes of our sort of project, I think what's sort of really interesting is, again, that Hegel is pointing out this lack of inwardness. Yeah, classic, the usual suspect. Exactly, yeah. And that's it. He does He does say they have exquisite gardens because yeah. they are not rigid and formal. No. They have... Uh... Which is interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I remember um, when I was studying French literature, I kind of got into a bit into uh, different guard gardening ideologies in the 18th century. <laughs> Sounds like a super hotly debated issue. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, the whole the, there was this whole like uh, opposition between the French garden, which was highly <laughs> structured. And, and formalized and the English garden which was meant to have the appearance of being wild but it was designed to look wild and my god yes the yeah crazy was, things people got up to back in those I, days yeah exactly yeah and uh, I wonder what Hegel would say about that because he seems to like this idea of nature being uh, represented as itself and not as being sort of constrained in these artificial expressions. Yeah. Um, well, I would wonder what the ancient Chinese would say to the French in the image. I wonder what they would say uh, as well. Yes. The masters of horticulture. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, come around and say, like, we will teach you how we will teach you how it's done. <laughs> okay. So now we come to. So that's that's all he says on art. So that's that's ex exceedingly brief. Yeah. Super brief. Um, but then we get on to religion. Indeed. And this is a really interesting section. Um, do you want to start us off, Philip? Well, first of all, Hegel begins talking about how he's suspect of the information he has because he's got it from missionaries. 
Mm. And who knows how uh, sketchy those guys can be. <laughs> right. <laughs> when it comes to religion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, he talks about how there is a state religion and that it's kind of like separated from the private religion, which right. isn't like, I think for us moderns, that is an unfamiliar idea. But in ancient um, nations and peoples, that was pretty common. You had like a, the Romans had their state religion. Peasants had, you know, plebs had their own thing going on. There was ancestral worship. Like there is, there seems to be here a lot. Right. Yeah. Like venerating the ancestors. Yeah. Um, there is a, um, you know, a plethora of spirits out and about. Right. Uh, mythos, the Shen. Yeah. A mythos surrounding uh, spirits at work in natural elements or embodying natural elements or being certain natural thing, nature, uh, animals and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so you have like a kind of like you have like a mishmash of things. You do, yeah. So you've got this sort of, you seem to have a sort of an overall god, a yeah. supreme, uh, which is Tian, yeah, or heaven, yeah, and also uh, Shang Ti, the supreme lord, yeah. And Hegel gives a little description of how people think about Tian. He says, human beings pray to God as the ruler of earth and heaven, who is one, eternal, benevolent, and just, and who rewards goodness and virtue and punishes evil and crime. It is pure and simple on account of its abstraction. So Hegel is sort of latching on to this idea of a very abstract God, mm -hmm. of um, an indeterminate notion of the absolute i think is um the most sort of uh hegelian way to put it yeah although it's not completely indeterminate it's 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 connected with heaven mm -hmm. and that is something we see also you know in christianity right why is heaven heaven right heaven is you know ultimately regarded as good because that's kind of the domain of god and blah blah so, yeah even if we don't equate god with heaven and like a pretty tightly bound up mm, kind of though but it's like a but, that, but that's the difference that hegel wants to draw though right it's um the difference between the god being the domain and there being the domain and god is in it yeah um he mentions this really cool dispute which is whether tian literally means heaven as the natural aspect, like what is up there, mm -hmm. or just the abstract notion of God. And um, Hegel says, it is surely correct that no people can be said to take to have taken what is simply sensible to be the divine, since it is necessarily spirit's nature not to stop short with its natural aspect, but to proceed to something inward. All pure religions involve a metaphorical transposition from the sensible into thought. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting because Hegel is sort of um, the Hegelian approach to religion is to take seriously the uh, the spiritual aspect of this. You know, some uh, uh, a more modern thinker might say, well, you know, it's just their way of talking about that place in the sky, mm -hmm. uh, where a, a very sort of naturalistic explanation. Yeah. Whereas Hegel. Will will always find space in religious thought for spirit, and will prefer the spirit aspect of it to just the, the merely um, reductive sort of right. reductive nature. Yeah, but I, I also want. I think I want to would say or put say more strongly that there is also a conceptual point with this in the sense that you don't have religion unless you do this kind of transposition. Yeah, exactly. If you really think that the Supreme Lord is up there, as if you know, if you just grew a pair of wings, you could get up there and say hi, you're dead wrong. <laughs> missing the point. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, same same way he, he make gives an example of, of the Persians with regards to light, worshiping light. Mm. Did they mean by it natural light or the light of thought? Mm. So it's a way in which 
what we see in nature kind of exemplifies the concept in some sense or the immediacy of the concept or its aesthetics of the concept so it kind of gets us there halfway but it's not reducible to it no yeah yeah so, so i think that for hegel it, it this step into the conceptual is necessary in religion that uh, for it to be religious proper yeah exactly yeah For it to be uh, kind of regarded as as a form of absolute spirit or as a form of be knowing something in a certain way. Mm. Yeah. I wonder if it's also worth mentioning the fact that Tian is also sort of a, a moralizing entity. Mm -hmm. So again, we have this idea of an individual, a supreme individual from whom the moral law flows. Mm -hmm. uh, Hegel doesn't explicitly connect this with the emperor. No. Um, but implicitly, the connection seems to be there, right? If the because also the emperor is, um, the emperor alone, he's, he, the, he has this whole section about how the emperor is the one that is meant to worship uh, Tian for the state religion. Uh, he says, Where is it? The corollary is that the emperor alone is called son of heaven, and he alone presents the offering on behalf of his entire people. Mm -hmm. The emperor alone presents the offering. He alone carries out the act of worship. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, there is this tight relationship between the emperor as the, the moral exemplar, the moral law for people, and the emperor as being the only person that can worship, or the, the representative, I guess, who worships the god, Tian, who is sort of a moral arbiter. Mm -hmm. yeah um, this reminds me of how in Egypt the pharaoh is the only one who can kind of actually do the rituals for uh, okay. the um, for the gods the, the priests uh, the priesthood they only act in his name they, they, they are standards for the pharaoh I but see in, but in, in the truth in reality it's the pharaoh who is doing all of the things because he is kind of the access point, or he or she is the access point to the divine, and that's kind of his big, his or her big responsibility is to make sure that the state goes well and that the gods, you know, they maintain their good relations with the gods. Mm. Uh, okay. So yeah. it's very similar to what we're seeing here with regards to Chinese, and that also means that. It's kind of like proto-Christian in a way, hmm. right? So heaven doesn't doesn't go down as a kind of you know God becoming the sun and so on, but someone down here is, you know, has a VIP pass that can you know get us in touch with the with the with the one upstairs and make sure that you know we know that everything is is fine. Mm -hmm. So. There is this um, uh, contact point between the universe, universal and particular with regards to the divine. Right, yeah, and that's the emperor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's really good, yeah. because uh, That's an interesting thing to point out because Hegel criticizes it for not having a moment of particularity. Yes, he does. Yeah. So that's interesting that you, you mentioned that. So there's a whole paragraph where he talks about what religion ought to be, what religion is. Yeah. And then he concludes, so he says, it is rationally essential that the absolute not be something indeterminate, but instead particularize itself. Yeah. And that the particular or the determinate even be posited within the absolute and be recognized, known, and envisaged in it. Yeah. Then he concludes the paragraph by saying, this absolute is still not comprehended 
as itself, thus the term within itself. Yeah. In as much then as the Tian of the Chinese lacks determinacy, it thus falls outside the absolute. And this universal status to which the particular is exalted lies outside it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what's what's missing here is, of course, that the Tian or the divine, the Supreme Lord, themselves particularize. Exactly, yeah. Right? That there's, doesn't happen. There's only external relationship to a particular. Yeah. And you, you might even say that that exaltment of the emperor is itself a kind of uh, external exaltment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so again, the absence of an inwardness in this respect with the absolute, the absolute doesn't have, I'm reminded, uh, there's this expression that uh, Hegel uses to talk about the story of how, of the fall of Lucifer and the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the story of Genesis and Hegel really likes the story because Lucifer which ends up becoming sort of the material world is the is the negative of God he comes from God and it's through the development of God that there is the absolute there is the opposition to God and this kind of internal self-relation, this kind of internal positing doesn't exist in in this picture mm -hmm. of, of the relationship between Tian and the emperor. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the emperor isn't also Lucifer, right? Lucifer uh, sure. kind of does something wrong. Yes, and exactly. Falls out of grace. Whereas here, the emperor is trying their best to get back in the graces and live up to the graces. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Even more so. Exactly. Yeah. So Lucifer sort of makes it. Yeah. There's a sort of a self movement in Lucifer as well. Yeah. Um, to rebel and to to become other to God. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Whereas the point for the emperor is to not rebel, is to maintain, right? Is to keep stability and keep order. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how helpful that analogy is, but I just... <laughs> I thought... obviously no, are... It's a good difference. I think it's, it's a good it's good thing to highlight the difference, right? There isn't a sense of why... Like, this becomes, I think, the core problem of the wisdom traditions they have, right? So there mm -hmm. is moral instruction, for you need to do so and so in order for things to go well, but why don't you already do those things in the first place? Mm -hmm. Right? Why do things go bad? Presumably, nobody wants to do bad, and yet a lot of bad happens. Why? So, I, so uh, the metaphysics needs to reach a different level where they kind of can see that uh, the bad is kind of part of the good somehow intertwined right there, there cannot be a clean split right yeah yeah yeah, interesting, yeah. Uh, that also shows another you know lack of imminent development yeah uh, the good and bad or good or evil kind of things yeah. unless you would just want to be a manichaean you know right just posit that yeah the the world is carved up into the good and bad uh, deities, and that's it. Well, to be fair, though, the problem, the problem of evil, though, is something that Christianity struggled with, probably still struggles with. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that reckoning is still not complete. And then Hegel comes to the Shen, which is sort of this moment of particularity. Yeah. In Chinese religion. Mm -hmm. It's the souls of particular things. So it's sort of um, the embodiment. The, the, the It's the spiritualization of nature. So like river spirits and mountain spirits. and Yeah, true... good old superstition. <laughs> yeah. Even though I went on Wikipedia, that uh, bastion of knowledge. Yes. And apparently... Uh, Shin also refers to the human spirit or psyche 
It is the basic power or agency within humans that accounts for life. And in order to further further life to its fullest potential, the spirit is transformed to actualized potential. Mm. Okay. That was a rather interesting um, further meaning of the word. Yeah. Uh, because it, there's a bit more interiority in that in that in that yeah. meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, and and when you do have all these different Shen living in nature and in different abodes, rivers and mountains and so on. Yeah. Because Shen is also a denominator for the human psyche, well, then the psyche is linked up with all those other externalities, such yeah. that you know heaven the heavens become the dome of the of the of the brain basically or the dome of the mind yeah exactly so, you know it's all external yet it's all itself nested into this bigger thing that is mm. the psyche yeah so it's like yeah like little pockets of externally relating things which are part of this greater thing, but I guess it's their their interiority is not made explicit yet. No, they're still seen as something out there operating exactly. on its own, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, th and this would probably psychologize it too much. <laughs> but yeah. it's like when we're um, naming rivers and mountains and so on, uh, giving them kind of personality. Mm -hmm. Really, they, we are just depositing bits of our own personality out there, right? And have it reflected back to us as something outside of us. Mm. It can be helpful to make sense of ourselves because it's so messed up in here, you know, as it is. So why not make some more space? Why not name things? You know, anger, joy. Oh, that's what I'm feeling. Right. <laughs> so maybe we're not doing it with you know, actual objects, mountains and so on, but we are kind of depositing bits of ourselves into discrete units and concepts and understandings. Yeah, that's right. And that these things seem to have a life of their own, apparently, and can have interesting drama, you know, happen amongst one another, right? When mm -hmm. anger meets joy or when this mountain uh, comes up against that uh, river or whatever, right? Mm. You know, the forest grows too close to uh, the lake, um, you know. So, so, yeah. so, so again, we see like this this further development of spirit, where spirit has gone out of itself into nature. Yeah. Uh, there yeah. the, 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 the just isn't yet that return. No, there is no return, and it remains implicit. It remains implicit, exactly. It's, yeah. it's not knowing known to itself what it's doing to itself. Yeah. And then the final section of religion is where Hegel talks about particular sects. Yes. And this is where he mentions Lao Tzu. Yeah. Which uh, involves here, uh, you know, Tao Te Ching, right? Right, sects. yeah. Which uh, is the closest thing to speculative philosophy. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's funny why... Um, Hegel doesn't draw a closer connection between this and philosophy. Yeah, right? Because yeah, says, yeah. yeah, here is the beginning of the elevation of human beings to, to the divine, of the absolute identification with the divine absolute. Mm -hmm. This withdrawal into self. These are all things that you'd think Hegel would be more excited about. Yeah. But he spends almost no time on it. I mean, it might be that he thinks it's more of a Hindu thing, and so he's going to talk about it when we get to India. Oh, I in see. Okay. Section. Yeah. I, I, that's just, I don't know. I haven't read ahead. That's just a, a theory. Yeah, but Taoism is, is you know, Chinese, isn't it? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. 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 So, and whatever the, you know, it might be influenced by Hinduism and, and all of that, but that doesn't detract that they might have done things their own way and come up with their own ideas and speculative sure. uh, yeah. concepts. So yeah. if anything, Hegel should have put more emphasis here and unpacked it, right? Because I think he would have a lot more to say about it. Right, yeah, I agree. You would think, yeah. Um, he talks about Buddhism as well and Lamaism. Hmm. And all these things do sound to be much more in the direction of what Hegel would like to see. 
Yeah. And yeah, one paragraph and that's it. Um, maybe the reason is because he really doesn't want to dwell on it because this isn't about the history of philosophy or philosophy as such. This is about world history, right? And stuff that moves the world. And uh, mm. religion has a, has, might have a, it plays an important role of the, in that, but it isn't maybe the main driver of history. So definitely not. I agree completely, yeah. But it seems worth mentioning as well. Mm. Um, because this could be, I mean, for example, Hegel could have pointed this out as the moment of development mm. yeah. in Chinese religion. You know, he could have made more of it by saying, look, we've been talking about this people that has a religion that doesn't really encourage internal reflection and is much more focused on external relations. And here we have the other religion that does encourage sort of interiority and inwardness. Yeah. And, you know, you could sort of point and say, look, this is a sort of a development uh, from one to the other. Yeah. But I think, yeah, you're also right. Yeah. I'm sure if we look in the philosophy of uh, the lectures on religion, he probably talks about this much more. Okay. And just, yeah, the final sentence. From this presentation of the first patriarchal empire, we pass over to the second, to India. Yes. And so to India next week. Indeed. Although I want to talk about something uh, very, very briefly, and that is the mandate of heaven, which Hegel seems right. to omit completely. And I think... Is Glaring omission. Big, plays a big part in um, not just uh, metaphysical thinking for ancient China, but also political. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to be like a um, counter response or a counterweight to the lack of rights for the lowest of the low, right? To, to people who are not on official and so on, right? Um, they can't really argue for themselves on behalf of the law. But there is this other space that is the mandate of heaven, which kind of sits above the emperor even. Mm -hmm because it's their mandate that's given to them by heaven, which we've learned in this episode is Tian, just the Supreme Lord. So um, it's almost right. like the emperor themselves or himself need a justification in order to be. Mm. So they don't have completely the unrestricted power. Yeah, They have power insofar as they have the mandate. How do they have the mandate? Well, they have the mandate through seeing what's happening practically in society. Mm. And uh, if you know, if, if there's a lot of poverty or if crops are failing, natural disasters, foreign invaders, in you know, internal disputes, etc. If there's a lot of you know so social upheaval, mm -hmm. uh, if people might see that. Well, it looks like Tian is not happy with the current emperor. Yeah. Right. We have a right to rebel. We can yeah. we can do something about this, and we yeah. have the backing of the divine on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that overrules all you know all the sort of bureaucratic law and so yeah. on because it stands higher. It's the metaphysical plane. Right. Yeah. Law. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. But so yeah, that's a really good thing to mention. But maybe it's also worth mentioning that this doesn't fundamentally change the whole picture, right? Because yeah. <laughs> we still have just this sort of the moral law just coming down from one place. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Well, another thing about this is that well, how do you know somebody some somebody has lost or you know maintains their mandate? Yeah. It's only if the rebellion or the uprising wins. Right. Yeah. Right. If they win against the so and so, then yeah, they have the mandate. Yeah. Right? But yeah. if they lose, well, it means that the emperor oh, didn't lose their mandate, and so they they keep it. Yeah. So it's only justified after the fact. It's a flawless system, if you ask me. 
but but still it's if we you know it's <laughs> it's it's it looks silly but it's also something that you might see it's um highly attuned to the practical reality yeah so it's point. it yeah. is whatever is it makes sense within the, what we're talking about yeah so it's it's a principle that's always actual yeah it can never be impossibility mm -hmm. yeah so, so I, you know, one it might look silly because it's always justifying itself after the fact yeah and so it doesn't work as a theory but if it's not a theory it's it's a it's a kind of moral uh principle or something of a uh, justification that people can use right to use certain things yeah 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 so and the, the idea is also that it keeps the emperor in some check presumably you would hope yeah yeah no that's really good i like that practical aspect of it that you pointed out i think that's a really good thing to point out uh, and, it, and, it, and it, it chimes well with everything we've seen as well with regards to science art and religion and oddly enough, it um, it also you know we see these various different dynasties coming up and going in China. And we might look at that and say, well, hang on, this is a really um, unstable system because we have all these dynasties coming on after one another and all these uprising and rebellions. Yeah. But the fundamental structure of the mandate of heaven is remains unchanged through all of this because. Right what they see themselves doing is that, well, whatever embodied system we have now is not working anymore. Somebody else needs to take charge and they have a right to take that charge, mm. take it by force from the others. And that is a kind of legitimate thing to do. And then once the new dynasty does take power, they establish themselves as having taken the mandate of heaven. So them coming up to power isn't disturbing the uh, metaphysical order of things right it might disturb the kind of temporal system right now but that was meant to go away because it lost its mandate anyway exactly yeah, yeah. so it's always justified yeah and it's always it's, but it's also kind of like a a a way for the system itself to get rid of corruption or deficient elements if you see mm -hmm. because the whole reason anyone loses their mandate is because they can keep order yeah something you know, they became lax, right? And I, guess it, and I guess in a sense, it's not entirely whimsical because failing to defend your country from an invasion, failing to plan for uh, a possible famine, failing to administer things correctly are yeah. concrete failures of leadership. Yeah, indeed. Um, so if anything, again, to highlight the practical aspect that you, that you mentioned, it's it's a very reasonable kind of uh, system for statecraft. Yeah, although it does it does come with in its own bag of contradictions. One That's of them true. being, you know, I was reading about the Han dynasty who kind of came to power through exactly rebelling against the established order. Once they came to power, they sort of solidified their rights through saying, "Well, yeah, we just got the man of heaven. It's now ours. We got it." Because, you know, Tian likes us. He thinks we can get the job done. Now, if they get rebellions, they have to squash them. Yeah. But they themselves are the, <laughs> um, the result of a rebellion. Mm -hmm. So how do they justify squashing other rebellions, right? They kind awesome. of, there is a tension right. there. Huh? I guess you just have to wait and find out. <laughs> I, well, I suppose, yeah. Will they or won't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, great. Yeah, well done for, for 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 raising that. That's a good thing to discuss. The mandate of heaven. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, let me uh, final point I want to add, and that yeah. is that even though this mandate does seem to offer some protection to kind of people with less less power, they only have that power and mass. So it's cool. still not a a kind of measure for the individual. Yeah, it's a measure for the whole, how the whole is functioning. Yeah, but not as um, you know, for kind of, kind of any giving any kind of subjective right to any one individual, right? Right. Yeah. So, so again, even in their again, yeah. of, of rights, their subjectivity is just dissolved into yeah. the mess yeah. of, of the whole peasantry. 
Yeah, you need you need a critical mass in order to evoke sort of the mandate of heaven. Yeah, right. Very good. All right. Well, we made it to the to China then. We finished China. We're done with China. We're done. We're done China. Next week, India. Indeed. Uh, we'll we'll move on to India. Yes, very very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, make sure to leave any comments you have about uh, if you know more about uh, ancient Chinese religion or art or even philosophy and science. Let us know what you think about uh, Hegel's analysis of it and whether you think the conceptual points that Hegel makes um, are valid or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's all from us then. Yeah. Goodbye. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.